Hey guys, back with our Sunday study in Matthew. This time in chapter 8, coming out of the Sermon on the Mount, while well, Jesus is coming down the mountain. Wow. And heads up, we have my brother here doing Bible study with us. So yeah, if I was you hear wondering another was person gonna... talking off to the I was what? I was, there you go, you did it. I was like, man, before we should start, I should introduce Alan, because he's just here as a guest mm -hmm. with us doing this, so this is pretty cool. This is Heidi's little brother. Hi, guys. It's awesome to have him here to be able to, be able to study with us on it. So finishing up the uh, Sermon on the Mount, which I hope you guys liked. I totally loved going through it. I hope everybody else did, too. But going back into 8, I will just start in verse 1. When he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him. Lord, if you will, can you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone. But go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a proof to them. Let me go ahead and stop there in that. Um, the reason why Jesus didn't want anyone, he didn't want them to say anything to anybody, is that he didn't want to draw anybody in any unwanted attention just for the sake of miracle healing. Was it a miracle healer? That wasn't that wasn't his point. That's what, that's not what he was doing, just for the sake of miracles. They didn't he didn't want that. So that's the reason why he didn't want to to draw that unwanted attention to himself as well. We can see that all throughout the Gospels where Jesus said, "Don't say anything," and then they said stuff. Yeah, every time he's like, "Don't say anything, just and, go." And, and for a ver and, and he said that for a variety of reasons. Each time it was it was usually at different times in his ministry. So um, at the beginning, it was first kind of you know like, "Hey, shh, shh, you know, I don't really, don't really want you to say anything," and then then you get kind of. Uh, into it a little bit more here where he's he's just not wanting to draw just he's not a faith healer <laughs> so that's all he is but yeah, that's, but that's not, not his purpose he and he then that's not definitely doesn't want that attraction here and remember this is early in his ministry so he you know he doesn't want to be like oh yeah this is the you know this is the guy that lays hands on him, cleanses lepers, and does all kinds of crazy stuff. So that's not what he was going for. Uh, verse 5. When he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown out into the outer darkness, in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to the centurion Jesus said, Go, let it be done, for you, for you also have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. Um, yeah, that's an overall picture of the whole kingdom. The whole story. Yeah, the whole story right there. Well, and that's what's With... so amazing. You have this Roman soldier, right? He's a centurion. That's what he is, who's coming to Christ. And then when Christ is like, yeah, I'll heal him. He's going, no, 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 like, you don't even have to come do this. You can just say this, and it will be done. Like, that's just, I feel like, the view we have of what... Yeah, because when you think of a uh, Roman soldier, it, it's, it's <laughs> not a Jesus believer. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. that's like, not what you're it, thinking of. Th- yeah, th- these are people who worship idols on magnitudes that you it, yeah. And to have that, yeah, that that really does show how, how do you word that? It's just, I mean, it's really amazing to see that I think, and that's what gets me is this image we have of what the the time and place looked like you know yeah. that there were Jews that followed God and then like that was it we don't understand how um, <coughs> how many Gentile believers of God that there was you know mm-hmm. and that's where you see in the letters it's such a big deal and they're constantly addressing the whole circumcision thing mm-hmm. because even before Jesus like coming into this time there were many Roman Gentiles who believed in God they went well, to synagogue. And, and they Ro- did the stuff. And in Roman culture, that was mutilation of the flesh. They thought it was disgusting. They thought yeah. circumcision was absolutely like. But that was like the know, thing like, that held so many back because they were yeah. all, they, they believed in God. They went to synagogue each week. Like they did those things. They were kind of. I already just didn't being, really want to get with your whole little mutilate yeah, the like flesh they, thing. They wanted to be grafted in, but then there were certain practices and traditions that kept them out. So for this Roman centurion to come up and be like, Dude, yeah, I believe it. You can do it. I believe that you can. You don't even have to go there. Like if this is how it works in our worldly example where I have people under me and I command them and they do as I say, you have the authority and power to do that here. So another the another thing that I want to po- uh, point out here when well, Jesus is, is um, marveling at the centurion's faith Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, saying not at all Israel, and he's saying um, many will come from east to west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. This is a reference to the future messianic banquet, which we know is a marriage supper of the Lamb. Mm-hmm. So he's making he's a reference. He's like I said, he it's you know wow if that isn't the whole picture of the kingdom there yeah uh, it really is because in that statement when he says that many will come from east to west this is talking about the 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 marriage supper of the lamb to recline at table recline at table obviously is a um uh, a very uh, uh jewish term mm-hmm. they would know because obviously when they sit and eat they they recline and they lean on their their elbow and then they eat um, and they kind of they sit around the table. Nobody it's can like see me. Nobody can see me doing this, but I'm sitting here <laughs> describing this to Alan. Um, Brandon is the directing way that they, how one will do that. Yeah, in I mean, I'm sure most man. of you. That's really cool because we have a lot of people that used to be Torah observant um, that, mm-hmm. that follow us, or even people that are Torah observant and stuff. So they they know what this means. <laughs> they understand that. But uh, for anybody that doesn't, just go, um, just just go research some of the. Um, you know some of the old Jewish tradition like that, and in these little references like that make a lot of a lot more sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, so I mean that's a that's a really awesome mm-hmm. little little thing in there. Uh, where are we at? Verse fourteen. Yep. yep. And when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she rose and began to serve him. That evening they brought him to many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word, and he healed all who were sick. It's so funny when they talk about Peter's mother right there because... Uh, Only a mom <laughs> would get up yeah, like, being you would, and be like, let me go cook for you. You know, it, it was, normally you'd be like, okay... This doesn't necessarily mean that she got up and just started serving right away, but yeah, a mother probably it was a mom. would. She this did. this she might went be literal. Made up something to eat. She got something to drink. Yeah, yeah usually this is usually usually whatever something like that is said. It's just he's kind of um, Matthew kind of shortens um, the story story a little bit uh, here. So, um, well, Man- Matthew has a tendency to do that with all of his mm-hmm. all of his stories. Just matter like the one that we just talked about with um, Jesus coming down, yeah. um, and, and and this whole centurion it, to begin with, because it was actually messengers that went to Jesus for the centurion. Yeah, and and so that's where the, the but Matthew was just like he doesn't care about the whole story about the 
the Give back and forth. Version, I'm just going to yeah. give you the condensed verse of what the centurion was actually trying to communicate to Jesus. So, um, As opposed to going through every single detail of every story, which we do too. And that's the thing that's so interesting with the Gospels. They're all different in different ways because they're all trying to accomplish a different thing. Yeah. Just like if all three of us saw a different mm -hmm. event happen mm -hmm. and we went to retell it, we mm -hmm. would retell it in a different way. I would retell it based off of who I was telling it to, the purpose of why I'm telling him this, and then the way that I explain it. It's that. really, um, it, it's a part of apologetics that I think that every believer, uh, I love apologetics. I just don't have the patience for it, so that's not my ministry, and I don't, yeah. you know, this channel is not apologetics. I've said it a million times. Yep, a million and one. Mil okay, so there's a million and one. Um, but the one real important... Um, part of apologetics though is the Gospels because there's that that's one thing that um, you know opponents of the gospel or non-believers and even will point out these these seemingly inconsistent um, things Details, that are in yeah. across the the mm -hmm. they're called the synoptic Gospels um, which yeah, I mean, you should go in, and, and I encourage everybody to go in and just study those, and because they're pretty complex, they're, they're but they're fascinating, and once you understand them, there's absolutely no, there's absolutely zero inconsistencies. inconsistencies. Yeah. It's you, you just you learn to understand how to to um, to be able to harmonize all the all the books. So yeah, I would definitely encourage that. But going back to um, Go home back to that. Yeah. Yes, I Only take it among... as quite literally. She got um, up and began serving them. <laughs> yeah, because then it says, and by later the evening, he was he was he he was casting out spirits um, and killing so the sick. This is an interesting day for him. This is a long day, uh, but this is also verse seventeen, right? Yep. Is that where we're at? Yep. The, Okay, so verse 17, this was also to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. So there's another messianic prophecy. Thank mm -hmm. you, Jesus. Um, then verse 18, I love this. This is, this is great. Everybody should have this circled. Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave over orders to go over to the other side. And a scribe came up and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Okay. Um, a scribe in uh, Israel, in this in this um, definition of a scribe here, was an expert in written documents um, as far as teaching, interpretation, and regulation of the law. And so they were experts on all of these things. And so they were just, you know... So when he's saying this to him, he's saying, um, "This will make a lot of this will make a lot of sense to what Jesus' response is." Yeah. Um, so that's when the, that it was a scribe that came up and said this to him. He says, "Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go." And then in verse twenty, and Jesus said to him, "Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head." Another one of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me go first and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Um, obviously, it, this, is, this is difficult and you have to drop absolutely everything and follow him with 100% of your heart. And that's what his response to, you know, the this, this scribes going, you know, I'm going to almost, almost maliciously... I'll follow you wherever you go. He's saying you have no idea what you're asking for. Yeah. You know, you you have to give up a lot. And even Jesus is obviously honoring um, the commandment of honoring your father and mother. And plenty by saying, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. That's, that's couldn't be more. There should be nothing that we need to take care of or do or have. Uh, care of here in this world that it goes before Christ mm -hmm. so if we feel called you know God calling us to do this or doing that you know any any way in which we are to serve Christ there should be nothing that can stand in that way I mean but it's not like he's saying anything mean I mean he's saying to the scribe here 
I don't even have a place to lay my head. Mm -hmm. Like that that's where I'm at right mm -hmm. now. So if you really want to follow me, like are you really down for that? <laughs> Cuz I'm assuming a scribe, someone with that type of education and and trade probably made money, you know what I mean? Like you mm -hmm. you made some money, you had a home, you know, maybe not the richest of the rich, well, but coming, I'm sure you had something yeah, coming, recently. Like you would coming down this would have been this would have been definitely your going into your middle and upper class, you know. Yeah, so are you willing to give up having a home, having the security that comes with that and all of these things, right? And then, two, to saying to the disciple, let, leave the dead to bury their own. Once somebody has passed, the only thing that mattered is, well, I mean, for us now, obviously, is their relationship with Christ. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to say, Jesus, hold on, I've got to go deal with this stuff over here. The, the person's gone. Like mm -hmm. the body that's left, like that. That's yeah. Follow not, me. You follow me. <laughs> yeah. Focus on me. Let There's that nothing work you can, itself out. Yeah. Let it's that work itself out. Anything. Yeah. It's, it's not it's disrespectful. In any no, way. not at all. And he, and like I said, he he clearly upholds the biblical command to honor the father and mother, uh, but the call to follow him is definitely more important than anything in yeah. in anybody's life. Um, so going on in 23 and when he got into the boat his disciples followed him and behold there arose a great storm on the sea so that the boat was being swamped by the waves but he was asleep and they went and woke him saying save us lord we are perishing and he said to them why are you afraid O you of little faith then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? <laughs> He's like, Okay, you guys, you've seen me cast out demons. Yeah. <laughs> you've Real seen me sick. heal this guy <laughs> with leprosy. And you guys are worried about a storm and it. it, it, it He's like, yeah, I just, I love that. I get that sense of just Jesus just waking up so annoyed. Like, yeah. why would you wake me up? Like, really? The whole, why? The whole idea of this scene, this picture you get is just so funny because you think of, I mean, you can picture this crazy storm on this little boat that they're on, and then there's Jesus just crashed out of sleep. <laughs> Mouth and open. Like, you, yeah, and you're like, dude, are you kidding me right now? Like, we're dying. Yeah. But what, what a neat picture this is in our lives how many times are we struggling with something in our life that we think is the end of the world right that we're like ah, I'm dying you know we're gonna perish this is it I'll never make it through to tomorrow and you feel sometimes like Jesus where are you yeah. why don't you care yeah. that I'm dying yeah. here and he's like are you kidding really? me really right have you not seen what I've done for you yeah. your whole life where is your faith where is your faith and that's where he says he doesn't he says little faith yeah which that that that's that doesn't that doesn't mean there's absence of faith that just means there's lack of faith mm -hmm. there's not enough mm -hmm. they're like oh yeah you know you forget you don't put your mind on you get so encompassed in the things and the problems of this world the storms of this world uh, that you forget um you know you forget and, and don't put your eyes on christ and don't end up trusting him and he's just like well, why do I, why must i keep dealing with you, dealing with you? why well look at in james that we were just reading in our daily bible studies when james is like you can't say you have faith in god and yes but hold on to and, your faith and, in right, the world right. you know you you have so right. if you are truly going to have faith in christ that he is going to handle things take care like you you have to be all or nothing. Yeah, yeah, and and if you don't, you're you're storm tossed. You're like yeah. a ship that's. Um, another. Uh, another part here on verse. Obviously twenty six. Well, twenty six and twenty seven here. Um, the. Uh, rebuking the winds and the mm -hmm. sea. And there was a great calm. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this is uh, command the force, commanding the force of nature, forces of nature, just like God. Like in Hebrews one, uh, chapter one, verse ten, uh, speaking of Jesus, uh, 
and the Lord laid the foundation of earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. So that takes me back to, um, you know, Jesus just, um, just a clear indication of his full deity and who he was. I mean, you have the the creator of the universe here that <laughs> is calming a storm. Yeah. Uh, that's just like he has authority over the yeah that's yeah so so he's was, now shown his authority over that's why sickness, they said his authority over the demons authority over right the and that's why their response in verse 27 and they said what sort of man is this that even the winds and sea obey him yeah you know that's like they're like what this is god this is the only god can well, do this but think of it like from our human perspective if you see somebody somebody's sick and then they're better I mean, that's nuts. You know what I mean? But I feel like we could almost kind of in our human understanding be like, well, you know what I mean? Like thinking of things and, and different stuff, you know, to try to rationalize what we're seeing. Yeah. You see a demon be cast out? Well, I mean, you think of like exorcism and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Like I feel like there's just ways that your human brain could try to be rationalizing out these things as you're trying to cope with everything that you're seeing. Well, you're seeing a storm and the sea and think like to the point that storm's gotta be bad enough that you're thinking you're gonna die, right? And these are fishermen. These aren't people that have never been out on a boat before. Yeah. So a little There's, white cap and they start yeah. freaking out. These are experienced yeah. men. And so when they start getting like, We're dying you know, I just think of King Julian, we're all gonna die. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there. When you get to that point and then Jesus stands up and everything goes calm what like how do you you can't rational like how do you you know cope with that well maybe it's coincidence maybe the storm was getting ready to break anyway you know what i mean like trying to think of like i don't know we're, we're used to being out on the sea this is not how this works you know is they're trying to cope with all yeah of this. it wasn't it's like pretty, yeah pretty nuts to try to i mean because again the disciples and all of his fault they're people just like you and i if you are seeing all this banana stuff it's a lot. I mean, our human brains <laughs> we struggle sometimes. Okay, so much yeah. Before. They're they're trying to figure because I feel like it's easy for us to read back in this and be like, "You guys, it's Jesus. Why would you not understand? You know, or whatever." But it's like you put yourself in those shoes. Yeah. You try to cope and comprehend all the things that you're seeing. It's it's a lot of banana stuff. It's mm -hmm. a lot. So, anyways, twenty eight. Around twenty eight. Yeah. Did you lose your spot? Yep, sure did. Hold on one second. And when he came to the other side to the country of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men met him coming out of the tombs, so fierce that no one could pass that way. And behold, they cried out, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Hmm. Okay, that's a really weird statement. So much in this right here. I love that statement. Yeah. There is a whole bunch in that statement right there. Number one, they just acknowledged him as son of God. Mm -hmm. Right? They're like, oh, crap. <laughs> he's he's here. What are you doing here? Um, they don't. Yeah, they right. Know him. Yeah. Right. But they, and they know that they will be judged at God's appointed time. Yeah. And they ask him if he has come there to torment them mm -hmm. before their appointed time. So, like, you just coming here to mess with us before judgment? Because, um, as I said, they know that there, there's no point in. Well, yeah, that's that you go in the prophetic books and you see all of the day to come, the great day of the Lord. I mean, they know this is coming. Right. So. But also interesting then that they know that today then you know was not judgment day so they Correct. know the, they know that there's specific things that are coming that are right the right coming right. that all of this happens well and these this right here was just oh uh, you're coming to torment us before we get started yeah like, yeah because they knew that they didn't they didn't have the whole plan but what they knew about is their their judgment yeah but he, they also are very aware of what their purpose is yes of being kept for you know until the end for eternal judgment they also know what that reason is um and 
that reason is is they're they're wreaking havoc even now and they even in the tribulation time it'll be it's kind of when they get loosed Mm -hmm. um but so yeah there there was there was definitely a lot a lot in just the statement in this interaction between jesus and these demons now a herd of many pigs was feeding at some distance from them and the demons begged them begged him saying if you cast us out send us away into the herd of pigs uh, i know this is weird that that there would be pigs in this but this was a gentile area of the sea of galilee uh, so they would have been there would have been raising pigs in this area But I love how, (laughs) leading into two, and he said to them, go. So they came out and went into the pigs, and behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the waters. (laughs) (laughs) There's just something about him casting them into pigs and just plunging them down. (laughs) It just cracks me up. The herdsmen fled, and going into the city, they they told everything, especially what had happened to the demon possessed men. And behold, all the city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they begged him to leave their region. <laughs> like. <laughs> too much. Too much. You are, you are causing a lot of, a lot of issues here. <laughs> okay, going into chapter 9. I guess we'll go ahead and continue going through Matthew we might as well just go ahead and finish it out I thought that's what we were doing I guess I said that but I know in the beginning I, I definitely wanted to do go through the Sermon on the Mount oh so you were wanting to stop after the Sermon oh, on the Mount that, I think that's what I originally thought oh. so I wasn't just really planning to go through this whole thing so I guess in saying that, this is truly just going to be a Bible study like between us that we're recording because I did not prepare for the rest of Matthew at all. I know Matthew, um, but as far as to um, put it out there and, and go super. I thought this is what we were doing. I had no idea that you were doing something else. Well, So that's all me. Actually, we've been doing a lot of other stuff. There's a lot of things right now. Yeah, you've kept me pretty busy in a lot of ways. And we're behind on, like, everything. So, I haven't prepared, but... Let's just read. Sometimes it's, like, the best stuff that you'll get is when you don't prepare. Sometimes I overthink and Sometimes go way too far. Sometimes, every time. Okay, every time. All right. Well, chapter... Nine then. We'll get Is that started. What I said? We'll get started on chapter nine today to kind of finish up our time here today. Even though we didn't have this uploaded first thing this morning, so we already Verse one and getting into a boat he crossed over and came to his own city. That would be Capernaum. You see I knew that much. And I didn't even I didn't even prepare. Anyway. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, you know, proving his divinity, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise and walk. But you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He then said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and went home. When the crowd saw it, they were afraid, and they glorified God, who had given such authority to men. Yeah, they know right when he said that he had the authority on earth to forgive sins um, Matthew did a really horrible job of summing up what the reaction to that response probably was 
Because <laughs> they probably flipped their lids when they said that. I mean, you Robes have... were torn. It was oh, bad. it was a mess. You thought the riots were bad, man. <laughs> uh, that was that was probably that was probably pretty rough. All right, verse nine. And Jesus passed on from there. He saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, "Follow me." And he rose and followed him. That was pretty quick. <laughs> that wasn't Matthew's point at all. Was to say any story about him right there, was it? Yeah. No. It's not about him. Yeah, no, nah, because I like Luke. Luke, uh, Luke's gives a little bit more detailed account of that. To that about process. Him. Anyway. And Jesus reclined at the table in the house. Oh, I'm sorry, verse 10. And as Jesus reclined at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I come not to call the righteous, but sinners. Yeah, I like... That's... Um... That's Luke 5.32. I have that written down from Luke, but that's the other way is... I, I came to call not the righteous but sinners. Um, yeah, this this part of Matthew's really really summed up really quick, obviously, because this was all kind of involving Matthew. It was over at his house that Jesus was having dinner, and a lot of this occurred. Um, so it's funny to see Matthew just kind of sum up the quick story of it and everything, but the. The point still gets through, and he's saying that obviously uh, people that are well, people in the church, those aren't the, the people that are doing fine and producing spiritual fruit. Those aren't the people that you want to focus your time on. Um, we're not worried about those. There's there's people out there that are that are struggling and that need help. Yeah, if you've been snatched out of the fire, then my Worry and my constant attention isn't going towards you. You know, I mean, we, we want to grow and continue in fellowship sure. and all this other stuff. But um, if somebody is in a burning building, I'm all the right out of the first responders. Everybody's going to rush over there to help them. You know, if you trip and fall on the grass, you know, a block over, well, you're not going to have the same level of response, right? That that wouldn't make mm -hmm. sense. So if you are without God, you are a sinner you're it, that's where the focus because the eternal fire is coming and right we want to snatch you from that and that's where i think uh that's why i like i'll just go ahead and add luke 532 in here for it because i think this just adds to all this and kind of gives more context to what jesus mm -hmm. says but he says i have come not to call those who think that they are righteous but those who know they are sinners mm -hmm. and need to repent yeah so that that kind of gives a lot more context, right? So why are you hanging out with those people? Well, most of the time, people that are caught like that know they're in a bad situation and sure. have no idea how to get out. Yeah. No, no clue. And that's what Jesus is is there for, and He's there to show you that in and to that there's no that you're not. You're not a slave to any sin. Mm -hmm. He's there to to free you from these things. Yes. Um, his heart his heart goes out to people that feel the weight of sin and the weight of the world in their lives and in their and and those are the people that that he wants to come and aid and and mm -hmm. and, and and soothe and, and fix. That, that's what he's here for um, you know but there's there's a there's a level of humbling that you have to come you know to before before he can do that so where do we live off leave off right you're in 14 okay 14 then the disciples of John came to him saying why do we in the Pharisees fast but your disciples do not fast. And Jesus said to them, 
Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and they will fast. Then they will fast. Uh, the bridegroom has always been identified as Yahweh. In Hosea two nineteen through twenty, he gives that the explanation there of the Lord is giving the prophecy uh, to Hosea, and he makes the likeness of him being the bridegroom. So when Jesus claims that he's the bridegroom here, especially to John's disciples, um, they weren't just they thinking, weren't just thinking like a groom. Like yeah, just a no, wedding. they so, they knew what he was claiming and what he was saying. Um, so that would have been that would have been just a huge uh, statement to them, but also from a, a Jewish perspective, yeah, they're there'll be a time when the bridegroom is not with them and then that's going to be your time for for fasting and mourning and that's unfortunately right now currently what the uh, state of Israel is in verse 16 no one puts a piece of untruck cloth on an old garment for the patch tears away from the garment and a worse tear is made neither is new wine put into old wineskins if it is, the skins burst and the wine is spilled and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wine skins and so both are preserved. While he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hands on her and she will live. And Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples. And behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for twelve years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said to herself, If I only touch his garment, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, Take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. It's kind of weird how Matthew slips that story in in between Jesus on his way to go heal mm -hmm. the daughter and then uh, puts a story right in there of the, the woman coming up and wanting to touch his robe and mm -hmm. believing that she could be healed just by faith. Yeah. Um, that's a huge, that's a huge key. I mean, it's it seems like a, a cheesy little church cliche that, that people always use, you know, faith, but it's very true. I mean, just her, just the belief of of touching his robe just mm -hmm. that amount of faith uh, made her well and then for a woman to have suffered this discharge of blood for 12 years think about where we are this meant that she was ceremonially unclean she couldn't go... from she couldn't do anything yeah i don't think we understand because we don't understand Gentiles, how huge we don't understand how huge this is in Old Testament law, if a woman is dealing with these menstrual discharges, you are ceremonially unclean. You cannot go and take your sacrifices to yeah, the temple. Yeah, you can't do anything. So therefore, her sins could never be atoned for right? because she, in the past 12 right. years, was ceremonially unclean and could not do these things. So to understand, like, we've got to wrap our heads it, yeah. around the weight of that and the fact that just touching her faith in Christ and him saying, hey, you're good to go. Your faith has made you well. I mean, that's huge. So she had 12 years worth of sins that could not be atoned for underneath the old covenant. And now Jesus comes in and is healed. And it's one of, that's one of those things where he, you know, he came and did these things right in front of, of Israel and, and they didn't even get that. They didn't yeah. even understand that. Like everybody knew who this woman was. No. Everybody knew what, you know, I'm imagining in the area. They knew who she was. They knew she what the issue was. They knew taken that her sacrifice yeah. for the past dozen years. Um, and this Can't guy comes along that. and he's like, "Hey, <laughs> feels it, no problem." And yeah, yeah, they miss a lot. But yeah, on the way to uh, on the way to that that happened. So, going into verse twenty three. And when Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute, the flute players and the crowd making a commotion he said go away for the girl is not dead but sleeping and they laughed at him but when the crowd had been put outside he went in and took her by the hand and the girl arose and the report of this went 
through all that district. And as Jesus passed on from there, two blind men followed him, crying aloud, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it done to you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus sternly warned them, See that no one knows about it. But they went away and spread his fame through all that district. I love you see that all the time. <laughs> Jesus says, don't tell anyone. I, okay, and then they run off and tell I, lo- I just love to just picture Jesus sitting there just be like, okay, don't tell anybody. And they're like, okay, okay, okay. Okay, yeah, yeah, no problem, no Guys. problem. Hey, everybody. Yeah. Come and see what he has done. <laughs> and he's like, I man. You. Because guys, come on. Mm-hmm. All right, 32. Right? Yeah, 32. As they were going away, behold, a demon-oppressed man who was mute was brought to him. And when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke. And the crowds marveled, saying, Never was anything like this seen in Israel. But the Pharisee said, He cast out demons by the prince of demons. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that... That doesn't make any sense at all. Never has anything seen. I love that. The the crowds marveled and said, Never never in Israel have we ever seen anything like this. And the Pharisees are just, eh. Yeah. It's Satan. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, okay. He just brought a girl back to life. He healed this lady. He's casting out it's demons. Gotta be Satan. <laughs> you guys give Satan way too much credit. But they they couldn't deny the reality of the miraculous things that happened because they said that the whole everybody marveled. Yeah. So like they the were like, oh, "Whoa, this yeah. is a trip." The Pharisees just like, "He's gotta be a demon possessed guy." Yep, that's it. Now going into thirty five. This is closing out chapter 9. Uh, this is one of my favorite parts of Matthew here. And there's a lot to this last little part, so I'll just read it and then go into it. When Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and affliction, When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Like I said, that is really, really, really deep when he says they were like sheep without a shepherd and he looked around and he saw the crowd that just says he looks around and he saw the crowds Mm -hmm. and then he began to have compassion on them he had he looked out and he saw real problems he saw real suffering he saw a social order that was not fair, that was not correct, that was not right. Notice that it said he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Well, the gospel of the kingdom is a completely different gospel than what it looks like, you know, Which is to why us. we started in the Beatitudes. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly why we started it. And he stood there and realized that... that, uh, they're, that the leaders and that the world failed these people. Mm -hmm. This is a sinful, Um, fallen, broken world. Not only only was Jesus fulfilling just many Old Testament prophecies during this whole time, I mean, with healing and, Mm -hmm. and, you know, healing every disease and affliction, these are all... These are all prophecies that he's fulfilling, so a lot of the... and displaying his divinity of who he was... Mm -hmm. Um, but n- there, there are a lot more than that too. Um, you know, it, it going back, Micah produce, uh, predicts that 
the Messiah would shepherd his people, the, mm-hmm. you know, and so that's when he was they're like sheep without a shepherd. But it goes just deeper into the, just the compassion of issue. If you look at the reason, so why he had compassion. Anytime Jesus shows an emotion or, or something like that, it's very, very interesting to mm-hmm. look into what it is. And it, every single time you see that it's just natural human emotion mm-hmm. that comes from this and knowing it and just understanding that uh, the world is just a sad place to be and it will always continue to be like this. And the people on top will always oppress the people on bottom until um, until our our triumphal entry king comes back. And, but what and a wait for throne. Christ to have there, you know, in that moment where he's looking out and he's just like, gosh, I mean, it this world yeah, sucks. It and hits you deep. People are yeah. hurt, yeah. and there's there's so much bad here. I mean, there's just so much. And to see that on people's faces and people's lives, sickness, disease, dying, anger, hurt, you know, I mean, there's just so much to take in. Yeah, it's just if you find yourself in a situation, you know, I, I think to a homeless person that would be a believer or or something like that that would, would think is, is just know that Jesus loves you and he had compassion and in in real compassion and real human tears because of these things because these things happen because the world is sinful and we're fallen and i i can't and he couldn't explain why every single situation unfolded not not saying that he couldn't I didn't mean it yeah, like that, yeah, but in a human way, you couldn't sit there and reason why some things happen to some people. Yeah. Why? That's not fair. I can't reason that. You can know why and you can understand mm-hmm. that, but you can see it and you say that that's not fair. And that's the type of compassion that he had. And that's the type of compassion that that keeps him longing i mean this is the this is the flip part where he actually longs for his children Mm -hmm. like a parent Mm -hmm. you know where it's it's crushing i've said it before but it's it's like on deployment you know he can't come home and Mm -hmm. he's it's you're you know his his heart is crushed by he sees these things he knows these things but it's not time yet he knows when it's going to be time we yeah. don't know when it's going to be time but it's just not time yet not there. but don't think just because we're not there yet that it doesn't hurt him every day in some way uh, until this process is complete well he's longing to be with he's, us longing as long as we're he's longing as much as we are him. with him yeah. and that's that's the type of compassion and love that he has given uh to us Mm -hmm. and so you know when when he sees this just gives a human element to christ that shows you that he is with you he loves you and that it will turn around Mm -hmm. Uh, not here yeah hopefully your your situation gets better here and that and and that we all should encourage each other other but our focus is on what's to come and and these these small little things that you think that you want the all these things are a shadow of the things to come so Mm -hmm. you know somebody that hasn't had this full life here and thinks that they're wasting their life and thinks that they're a miserable failure or thinks that they haven't done anything or they no that's not the case Mm -hmm. that's not the case at all that you've got a whole life ahead of you and you've got eternity ahead of you provided you you walk with him i mean the harvest is plentiful but the labors are few yeah <laughs> yeah kind of that'll work there and yeah. saying that it's it's difficult but i think that was a yeah, hopefully that was a good way to end out yeah chapter nine with their eyes focused on what's to come and not what's here i mean i think that's a good sure spot and to, and <laughs> just spot and just it. remembering how human 
Jesus was mm -hmm. in compassion. Mm -hmm. And this hurt him. Mm -hmm. And it does. And it's a real compassion. Yeah. And and we don't make that that connection enough. We don't, you know, we, we get too afraid that we try to humanize God or, try, you know, yeah. trying to do these things. Well, I don't want to think this certain way, to, you know, because you're like afraid to or something. But yeah. no, Christ walked on this earth as a man. Yeah. He was truly God and truly man. But he walked on this earth as a man and he had compassion and had tears just like you and I did. He woke up, you know, and, and was sad just like you and I mm -hmm. it's sad so just take courage in those things and know that um, you know know that uh, he's returning one day soon and all this will turn around and none of this will matter eventually yeah thanks for hanging out with us mm -hmm. this week guys um, we've got daily Bible studies going up every day all week long and then next Sunday we'll be back continuing on in Matthew so yeah maybe I'll even prepare next week <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't do it this no, week no but this is good I think I did it alright off the fly well we like we just want to be in our Bibles and yeah, we want other doing. people to want to be in their Bibles sure. too that's and this it is, no this fancy is, words yeah. no fancy show no smoke and mirrors just let's read our Bibles no I'm I, I always said that me and Paul are homeboys cause I don't have any great speeches or laughter or I don't claim to be good at it at all, but I do have understanding. Know how to read it. And know how to read it. So. All right, guys. Thanks. We'll see you next time. See ya.